Item number, SCP-18. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-18 is to be contained in its specialty metal restraint inside of a 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter sealed box, lined with heavy synthetic padding. The sealed box is then submerged in the center of the 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter polyethylene holding tank. If SCP-18 is to break free from the holding box, the polyethylene-based goo will slow down kinetic activity enough for proper retrieval by containment personnel. Personnel entering SCP-18's holding chamber are to wear specialized plating, found inside of SCP-18 observation, and a breathing apparatus before being lowered into the polyethylene tank. If SCP-18 is loose outside of the polyethylene tank, personnel are advised to secure themselves in a separate room, and close doorways or hatches to isolate SCP-18 until containment teams arrive. Description: SCP-18 has the appearance of a Super Bowl, made by the Whammo Company in 1969. It is 6 centimeters in diameter and colored red. Found when the company was hired to clean out a warehouse that had Whammo merchandise in it. SCP-18 was noted to be able to bounce with extreme height. At first thought to be a pleasant child's toy, SCP-18 was able to bounce with over 200% efficiency. That is, if dropped one meter, it would bounce two, then four, then eight, then sixteen. The ball soon became a dangerous projectile, reaching speeds estimated at over 100 kilometers an hour, and damaging property and injuring five in the city of It came to a rest after several days in the nearby lake of and was retrieved by SCP personnel. Due to the speed of the object and the total surprise by its victims, no cover-up story was required or initiated. Document 18-04 Message to O5 -1. I hope everything is well. The reason I write to you is because I believe I have found a more effective method for retrieving new or escaped SCP objects. Yes, I realize we haven't had any progress in reverse engineering whatever allows this thing to defy the laws of thermodynamics. But we have come up with a very effective method for integrating one of those new SCP A5 armor suits with this. Just hear me out. We implant it into the bottom of a boot. Rig up a little bit of a mechanical device, and ta-da! The suit is now capable of jumping well over a building. Also, if the wearer has their foot against something they want dead, well, let's just say it delivers a hell of a kick. All I need is permission to modify one of the pre-existing SCP-A5 suits, and you'll be able to actually capture plus any other escaped SCP objects. Trust me, when have I let you down in the past? Dr. Document 18-06, Letter to Dr. Dr. Upon assignment, Agent was issued your modified SCP-A5 armor in retrieving SCP- and the results are mixed. Agent was able to place the collar onto SCP- chase it through the Amazon and restrain it by dismemberment. However, due to a malfunction of your little mechanical device. He was launched almost a mile into the air and suffered two broken legs, seven broken ribs, a missing arm, and a skull fracture upon hitting the water of Lake on the way back down. You will fix that before I authorize your armor for common use. Document 18-11, message to 05. Don't worry, it's fixed, but I have some more ideas. If I can be granted the use of some water from SCP-6, SCP- and possibly SCP- I can deliver you a set of SCP-A5 armor and an agent that can capture any, if not all, rogue or unattained SCPs. All I'm waiting on is your approval. Item number, SCP-066. Object Class, Euclid Impetus. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-066 is to be kept in a safe deposit box at Site-21. Personnel level 2 or higher may perform experiments on SCP-066 after filing the relevant request forms. Researchers may log their results in Experiment Log 066 Beta. Note: Special containment procedures have been modified. The following now applies. 
SCP-066 is to be kept in a tungsten carbide box in Site-21's high-value item storage facility. Once every month, this box must be manually inspected for damage to the interior. SCP-066 consistently destroys any recording devices placed inside its containment box. If damage is present, SCP-066 must be moved to a new box. This task is performed via a robotic arm, capable of performing the task in under three seconds. Description SCP-066 is an amorphous mass of braided yarn and ribbon, weighing approximately one kilogram. Strands of SCP-066 may be taken individually and manipulated. When this is done, a note on the diatonic scale, C-D-E-F-G-A-B, is produced by the object. When a set of six or more notes are produced, SCP-066 will produce an effect of varying nature and duration. SCP-066 will not respond to manipulation while any effect produced by it is in progress. Prior to Incident 066-2, results have included SCP-066 transformed into a small calico kitten for 17 minutes. The kitten exhibited significant friendliness and playfulness and appeared to be declawed. A song lasting four minutes, acoustic guitar with vocal accompaniment by singer-songwriter The lyrics warned the listener not to use sharp objects without parental supervision. A small cupcake, chocolate with chocolate frosting, and a lit candle stuck in the top. Notably, the tones produced prior to this effect corresponded to the opening notes of Happy Birthday. SCP-066 became responsive after said cupcake was consumed. Incident 066-2 On April 18, 2008, D-066-4437 was instructed to use a pair of scissors to remove a portion of SCP-066 for testing. However, when he began to cut it, SCP-066 rolled one meter away from him before stopping and making an unidentified squeaking sound. Before he could be provided with further instruction, D-066-4437 attempted to cut it again. SCP-066 rolled away and produced the phrase, Are you Eric? in response. After D-066-4437 replied in the negative, SCP-066 morphed into its present state and began emitting loud, dissonant staccato notes until D-066-4437 was escorted from the room. After Incident 066-2, SCP-066 began to exhibit behavior highly inconsistent with its previous properties. SCP-066 now displays significant mobility, primarily in the form of being able to move tentacular portions of itself at very high speed. While SCP-066 is either unable or unwilling to use this ability for transportation, it will occasionally attempt to damage its containment by rubbing its strands against the side of the box, gradually wearing it down. This process appears to be unusually effective for the materials in consideration. Additionally, SCP-066 will automatically produce notes and effects in the presence of any human, regardless of whether that human interacts with SCP-066. This process takes a minimum of six seconds. In the aftermath of Incident 066-2, effects produced by SCP-066 have included a single bee was released near the containment, stinging D-4436 before flying away. The bee was not captured. It is unknown how the bee survived. Beethoven's Second Symphony was playing at over 140 decibels, causing permanent deafness in three personnel and permanent hearing damage in eight others. The room containing SCP-066 experienced a sudden and complete absence of light for five hours. Personnel in the room reported hearing loud breathing behind their shoulders, although no source was apparent. When it is not producing anomalous effects, SCP-066 will say the name Eric constantly, in a deep, masculine voice. Item Number SCP-120 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Due to its importance to the Foundation, SCP-120 is to be kept under video surveillance and armed guard at all times. Any personnel attempting to utilize the item without authorization are to be terminated immediately. All personnel wishing to use the item are required to submit a filled copy of the application form to facility operators. Due to the precise timing and coordination required for efficient use of this object in an emergency, 
All personnel entering SCP-120's building are placed under temporary command of the facility heads, Captain Security Detachment L-4, and Dr. Research Team L-4. All destination locations are to be kept under surveillance and armed guard. They are valuable to the Foundation, but are non-critical. But any compromised destination must be immediately reported to SCP-120 personnel. Distributed Task Force Sigma-6, Puddle Jumpers, was created with the objective of protecting and maintaining SCP-120's facility and location outposts. It consists of one command unit and one defense and maintenance unit based at the SCP-120 facility at Command Five units based at the destination locations, plus five reserve units for these, and five units assigned to other SCP-120-related projects. Description SCP-120 appears to be a small child's paddling pool, pastel pink in coloration, with an inner diameter of approximately 2.5 meters, an inner height of 0.3 meters. The pool appears to have been fabricated from common earth plastics, but has shown itself to be indestructible by any attempted means. The pool's structure and response to pressure are typical for such a pool. It will flex when pressure is applied, and is soft to the touch, but has amazing tensile strength, and cannot be permanently stretched or ripped. What is constrained within the pool seems to be a brightly glowing, colored, liquid-like substance, which seems to exist only partially in our dimension. It is unresponsive to manipulation by organic or inorganic means, but the substance ripples and shimmers systematically and regularly, suggesting it exists physically on another dimension. SCP-120's most interesting and useful property is used regularly by Foundation personnel. Human beings, when alive and carrying loads, including clothing under 37.8 kilograms, are observed to fall through the pool and are deposited at one of eleven destinations. The item will only function in this way if certain conditions are met. The subject must be genetically human. The subject must be conscious. The subject must be carrying weights of under the specified amount. And only one subject must be present on the surface. Test subjects attempting to use SCP-120 while these conditions were not met reported their feet making contact with a smooth surface underneath the liquid, but no significant effects were observed. SCP-120's main use is as a potential means of evacuation for command during a major emergency. It is currently stored and maintained in a fortified outbuilding of this facility. SCP-120 was first brought to the attention of Foundation authorities on 31-08-1992. Local police authorities in California were investigating reports of missing children in their jurisdiction and discovered and reported the item on 3108. Overwatch Command was automatically informed through the usual channels, and a small team of Foundation agents was dispatched to claim and transport the item to Site-19, where it remained for testing over the next two years. It was transferred to its present location at Command in 1994. Addendum Document 127 Destructive Test Results for SCP-120 2412-1993 Abridged Version Handsaw, 30 centimeters, no result. Industrial drill, steel bit, no result. Industrial drill, diamond bit, no result. Munition, 9 by 19 millimeter parabellum, no result. Munition, 5.56 by 45 millimeter NATO, no result. Munition, 7.62 by 39 millimeter, no result. Munition, 120 mm M830 heat. No result. Cutting torch. Acetylene. No result. Cutting torch. Hydrogen. No result. Cutting torch. Propane. No result. CO2 laser. Peak power. 100 kilowatts. No result. CO2 laser. Peak power. 500 kilowatts. No result. Document 12010 Detailed explanation of SCP-120's capabilities and destinations 1202-1994 Abridged version SCP-120 possesses the capability of instant translocation of human beings, possibly through one or more alternate dimensions. Subjects using the item are invariably deposited at one of eleven locations. These locations cycle in a specific and unchanging pattern 
The 11 destinations and their locations were determined through testing with Class D personnel carrying radio beacons. Location 1. Pacific Ocean. SCP-120's liquid displays a blue glow while connected to this destination. Subjects attempting travel to this destination are deposited an average of 2 meters above the surface of the Pacific, latitude and longitude undisclosed. A Foundation ship, SCPS Demeter, publicly the USS Nassau, a meteorological ship, is currently stationed at this location, and personnel arriving through use of SCP-120 materialize inside the ship's cargo hold. Sensitive Foundation material or personnel can be sent here in an emergency, and the ship has provisions for storage of low-threat SCP objects, should the need arise. Class D personnel used to dial SCP-120 can be confined and extracted by helicopter, or reused, or simply terminated, and their bodies retained in storage. The original Class D and radio transmitter used to determine this location were lost at sea, and might have to be recovered in the interest of secrecy if they were to wash up on populated shores. This configuration of SCP-120 was arbitrarily designated as number one, and has no observable significance above other configurations. Destinations 2 through 11 follow in sequential order after this configuration, and return to it after a full cycle. Travel by SCP-120 to this location is not advisable during storms, due to risk of injury. Location 2. Greenland. SCP-120 displays a bright white glow while dialed to this destination. Subjects traveling to this destination materialize 1.5 meters above the surface of Greenland, latitude and longitude undisclosed. A small facility was established here, under the public pretense of oil industry expansion. This facility has similar capabilities and use to the Demeter, and is additionally equipped with an airstrip and refueling facilities. Location 3 L3. Located at the Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 3, the SCP displays a deep black color. Objects and personnel sent through the SCP to any Lagrange Point, locations 3, 5, 8, 10, and 11, are effectively lost, as retrieval is impossible at our current level of technology. They may prove a possible way to remove small but threatening SCP objects, but for now, are merely an inconvenience as sacrifice of D personnel is required to move the SCP to its next configuration. Location 4. Himalayas. SCP-120 displays a white glow similar to when it is dialed to Location 2. Materialization occurs on a mountain in the Himalayan mountain range, latitude and longitude undisclosed. Only minor changes have been made to the destination, the digging of an 8-meter hole for disposal of D-class bodies, an overhead canopy for concealment and supplies and testing for evacuation to this location, which should only take place in extreme circumstances. D-class personnel used for dialing are to be injected with a mixture of sedatives and neurotoxin before sending, to ensure a humane death, and decrease risk of damage to the structures at Location 4. Location 5 L5 Identical to Location 3 Location 6 Sahara SCP-120 will glow yellow. Personnel materialize at a small outpost, latitude and longitude undisclosed. The need for secrecy renders this facility unable to house any significant SCP object, but is ideal for evacuation of personnel and documents from command. Location 7 Gobi SCP-120 displays a brown glow. This destination is located at a small outpost in the Gobi Desert latitude and longitude undisclosed, but is otherwise identical to the Location 6 outpost. Location 8 L2 Identical to Location 3, although shows more potential for SCP disposal, being situated beyond the moon. Location 9 Mare Imbrium The SCP displays a subdued gray glow when dialed into this destination. This destination is on a relatively flat section of the Sea of Rains, on the lunar surface. Through vast expenditure of money and D-class personnel, a small outpost has been established there and is considered one of the Foundation's safest locations. Location 10 L4 Identical to Location 3 Location 11 L1 Identical to Location 3 Item Number SCP-137 Object Class Euclid 
Special containment procedures. SCP-137 is to be kept in a locked room, with a hairbrush and posters depicting a country meadow to keep it placid and tractable. SCP-137 is to be fed three meals a day. Under no circumstances are any toys allowed to come within 500 meters of SCP-137. Description: SCP-137 is an entity with the ability to possess a toy, gaining the physical properties, size, and shape of whatever it represents. For example, a teddy bear will become an actual bear and behave accordingly. SCP-137 cannot possess any miscellaneous object, only toys. The observed range of SCP-137's possessive effect is 250 meters, but until further testing has been accomplished, SCP-137 is assumed to have a maximum range of 500 meters from its position. SCP-137 was first brought to Foundation attention after a series of bizarre deaths and incidents involving children. The deaths were determined to be too random to be a serial killer, and Foundation agents were sent in to investigate. It was located after an interview with a young girl suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, after a naked man had appeared in her bedroom. It was encountered in the same neighborhood, in the form of a gorilla. SCP-137 was then tracked and finally captured when it possessed a stuffed pony doll, and was chased into the nearby wilderness. SCP-137 was tranquilized, and extracted to Site-19 by helicopter. Testing has shown that SCP-137 takes on the characteristics of the toy it possesses, but only as a child might perceive it. A toy soldier becomes a violent, well-armed man. A toy gun fires bullets. A toy lion attacks and kills humans. However, it lacks true intelligence. It shows no sign of long-term memory, nor any capacity for learning or abstract thinking. It is currently inhabiting a princess doll. Addendum. Interview 137-1. Interviewed. SCP-137. Interviewer. Dr. Forward. Interview took place to determine what SCP-137 is, and why and how it possesses toys. Begin log. Doctor. Good day. SCP-137. Hello. I'm Princess Blossom. Are you my prince? Doctor. No. Now, can you please tell me what you are? SCP-137 I am a princess. I am the prettiest princess in the whole world. Doctor, where did you come from? SCP-137 I live in a castle. Are you my prince? Further questioning yielded similar results. End log. Experiment Log 137 Date Undisclosed Test Material a toy jet plane. Results. The toy was replaced by a full-sized F-16, which attempted to take off inside the testing facility, causing a great deal of damage. The debris quickly turned back to plastic, and SCP-137's current form reanimated. Notes. In the future, please avoid testing materials that come equipped with jet engines and missiles. This was an expensive test. Date. Undisclosed. Test material. A race car. Results. The toy was replaced by a full-sized Ferrari that attempted to race around the testing facility, ultimately crashing into the wall at high speed. Again, the debris turned back to plastic, and SCP-137's current form was reanimated. Notes. Vehicle tests now require permission from Director Date. Undisclosed. Test material. An alligator keychain fob attached to Agent Sorensen's keys. Results. A six meter long saltwater crocodile in a hallway. Fourteen dead. Notes. All agents must now be searched for toys or toy-like items before entering site- Date. Undisclosed. Test material. American soldier action figure. Results. The toy was replaced by an adult male human in a soldier's fatigues carrying a large rifle, which managed to kill five personnel before being terminated. Notes. Let's try something less violent next time. Date. Undisclosed. Test material. An Officer Jones beat cop action figure. Results. An adult male in a policeman's uniform. It kept asking where the perps had gone to, 
and insisting that researchers not take recreational pharmaceuticals. After interrogation attempts, it announced that the researchers were criminals, shot two, and handcuffed a third before being terminated. Date. Undisclosed. Test material. A stuffed panda. Results. A very large panda. It is to be noted that, despite their cute appearance and herbivorous lifestyle, pandas are still bears. It proceeded to hug one of the researchers, breaking three ribs before it was terminated. Date. Undisclosed. Test material. A box of plastic construction bricks. Results. A terracotta brick appeared inside the box. It vanished, replaced by a brick of a different material. This went on for several hours before the items were destroyed and the anomaly reanimated its current host. Date. Undisclosed. Test material. A yo-yo. Results. The yo-yo did not change form. However, it became autonomous, moving on its own and performing a variety of tricks, even when removed from the finger of a researcher and placed on a hook in the wall. Date. Undisclosed. Test material. A Dr. Selenium action figure, noted on the packaging to be the smartest man on Earth. Results. An adult male in a lab coat. It made repeated references to its astounding intellect. However, when questioned on any scientific or mathematical knowledge, it would not answer directly, only saying that it was the smartest man on Earth. Testing ended after several hours of fruitless questioning. Date. Undisclosed. Test material. A winged unicorn toy, based on a popular children's television show. Results. A small, disproportionately figured purple equine. Junior researcher asked SCP-137 questions about its adopted character and about its magical capabilities, but was answered only with cheerful non-sequitur statements. This included asking about said junior researcher's friends, declaring that friendship is the greatest magic, and requesting he fly to the castle with her, despite said junior researcher's lack of wings and SCP-137's lack of a castle. Testing ended within an hour. Notes. Junior researcher in light of this interaction has been removed from SCP-137 testing and officially reprimanded regarding using SCP objects to try to indulge his personal interests. Item number. SCP-190. Object class. Safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-190 is kept in Security Locker 23 at Site-41. Children under the age of 10 are not allowed within 50 meters of SCP-190, except under testing conditions. All personnel working at Site-41 are to be made aware of SCP-190's secondary effect and its innocuous nature. Personnel transfer requests made due to SCP-190's secondary effect are to be expedited unless doing so would violate the special containment procedures for another item. All individuals who have directly interacted with SCP-190 are to be monitored indefinitely for long-term side effects. Description: SCP-190 is a carved wooden box banded with iron, measuring 50 centimeters by 70 centimeters by 35 centimeters. The lid is carved with a representation of a large circus tent with an open central panel within which stands a figure dressed as a stereotypical ringmaster. The carvings on the sides consist of assorted animals, typically associated with circuses, including lions, tigers, bears, elephants, and horses. These carvings move at a maximum observed rate of approximately 5 millimeters per day, and time-lapse monitoring indicates that the depicted creatures appear to be acting in a non-violent play behavior with each other. When an individual aged 10 or older opens the hinged lid, SCP-190 contains 17 marbles of assorted size and color, two sticks of lightly used green sidewalk chalk, and one deck of bicycle brand playing cards. These objects can be manipulated within the confines of SCP-190, but cannot be removed from it. Attempts to remove these objects encounter an otherwise undetectable, impenetrable barrier stretching across the opening to the box. Individuals aged 10 or older who interact with SCP-190 or its contents typically report feelings of unease or discomfort until they cease interacting with them. 
When an individual under the age of 10 opens SCP-190, it will contain one to five toys or games intended for use by children. Observed objects include stuffed animals, rubber balls, yo-yos, dolls, blocks, and simple board games. These objects can be freely removed from SCP-190 by any prepubescent individual, although attempts by pubescent or postpubescent encounter the same barrier described above. The objects typically possess a circus theme, depicting classic circus animals, venues, performers, and design schemes, containing red, gold, white, stars, and or the initials HF. Children in the appropriate age range express great pleasure and excitement when playing with SCP-190 or the objects it produces, regardless of prior attitudes regarding toys or games of that type. Children exhibit more energetic play behaviors than they normally do, as well as more physical activities, such as somersaults, cartwheels, climbing nearby objects, and simple one and two object juggling. Most play behaviors include incidental elements of causing harm to other people, especially those older than themselves. All objects produced by SCP-190 are capable of causing extreme damage, regardless of their composition. Representative samples below. Objects produced by SCP-190 vanish if placed back within it and the lid is closed. Toy. Red and white striped rubber ball with a gold star on one end. Usage by child. Eight-year-old male bounced against a wall 37 times prior to throwing it at a supervising junior researcher. Result. The wall had noticeable shallow dents where it had been struck. The junior researcher suffered two cracked ribs and significant soft tissue bruising where she had been struck. Child expressed disappointment that junior researcher didn't throw the ball back. Toy. Stuffed elephant made of felt, measuring 35 centimeters in height, wearing a red and gold saddle with the initials HF embroidered on the sides. Usage by child. Four-year-old female moved toy as if it were walking, child making trumpeting noises before making it step on the foot of supervisory D-class. Result. D-class's foot suffered multiple complex bone fractures and hemorrhaging consistent with a crush injury. Child chided D-Class for getting in the way of the toy. Game See the Big Top, a board game of similar design to the 2004 edition of Candyland. Usage by Child Six-year-old male begged supervisory D-Class to play game, until D-Class was ordered to do so by researchers. Result Child lost game and threw cards at D-Class in anger. D-Class suffered deep paper cuts to the face hands, and forearms, requiring multiple bandages. Child hugged D-Class after completion of game and asked if she would receive Batman adhesive bandages to make the boo-boos better. Toy. Tin container labeled Junior Clown Kit, containing 30 grams, or one ounce, of clown white grease paint, two red jumbo makeup pencils, two yellow gold makeup pencils, small hand mirror, Usage by child. Seven-year-old female decorated own face and that of supervisory D-class. Result. D-class suffered mild chemical burns where makeup had made contact with skin and developed persistent allergy to lanolin. Child was unharmed. Toy. Lacquer finished red wooden rod, resembling a miniature version of SCP-2024. Usage by child. Nine-year-old female touched various furnishings around the room, including the Supervisor D-Class's arm. Result. D-Class's arm tied into a knot. Child commented on D-Class's improved physical appearance. After initial testing ceased following the determination of baseline properties, an additional property became apparent. If SCP-190 and its contents have not been used by a child under the age of 10 for 29.5 consecutive days, Faint calliope music will be audible to all individuals within 50 meters of SCP-190. This music appears to act as a mild cognito hazard, wherein children under the age of 10 will seek out SCP-190 if they are aware of its existence. Long-term monitoring of individuals who interacted with SCP-190 as children reveal that they are approximately four times more likely than age peers to become performers once they are adults, either professionally or as a primary hobby. Typical examples include acrobatics, 
magic and sleight of hand, animal training, and improvisational oratory and acting. Subjects do not otherwise display statistically significant behavioral abnormalities. Item Number SCP-174 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-174 is to be contained within Storage Unit 7 at Site-19. Removal of SCP-174 from containment requires the approval of two Level 4 personnel familiar with the entity. It is preferable to use personnel with high Psychic Resistance Scale scores when interacting with SCP-174. All personnel in contact with SCP-174 are to undergo psychological evaluation. Those who display obsessive or protective tendencies toward the item are to be treated with Class B amnestics and monitored for 72 hours. Addendum to Containment Procedures Following Incident 174-A, SCP-174 and the main chamber of Storage Unit 7 are to be monitored at all times via video surveillance. Abnormal activity must be reported to Dr. A immediately. Furthermore, a GPS tracking device is to be installed on SCP-174 in order to expedite recovery should the item translocate outside of Foundation custody. Description SCP-174 is a wooden ventriloquial figure measuring 53 centimeters from head to toe, with somewhat ragged clothing and slight damage to several sections. Judging by the item's style and state of repair, it dates from the early 20th century. The eyes and mouth of SCP-174 can be manipulated by means of a mechanism inside the figure. When viewed in peripheral vision, subjects report on occasion that SCP-174 is looking directly at them, with an expression of longing or sadness. When subjects look directly at SCP-174, this anomalous expression is not visible. Viewing SCP-174 indirectly, such as in a mirror or a live video feed, appears to increase the likelihood of this effect manifesting itself. Personnel in the vicinity of SCP-174 report a general feeling of sadness or sympathy directed toward the figure, but cannot explain any reason for these feelings. Prolonged exposure can lead to personnel personifying the figure to greater extents. Those with particularly low psychic resistance scale scores will in some cases begin to act as if SCP-174 were a living being, e.g. cradling it as if it were a baby. When informed of their abnormal behavior, all personnel revert to standard behavior patterns for at least several minutes. Subjects who place SCP-174 on their hand report an urge to converse with it. When questioned, they frequently report that the figure is lonely and needs companionship. The subject will also begin speaking for SCP-174 and manipulating its expression. When speaking for the figure, the subject's voice will take on a higher-pitched, childlike tone. Recordings taken with high-sensitivity microphones have determined that at no point does the figure itself actually speak or make any discernible noise. Regardless of the subject's experience, the act will be almost perfect. The conversation will quickly move toward a discussion of the figure's emotional state, particularly in relation to its past, in most cases leading to the retelling by the figure of a story of how it was abandoned or mistreated. No one story has ever been repeated, and therefore which, if any, is true is unknown. Researchers have theorized that SCP-174 may have low-level telepathic abilities, as each story seems to be based around a theme that will have particular resonance with the current subject. Past this point, subjects will show great affection for SCP-174 and will attempt to protect it from people who come too close or try to interact with it, in some cases, with deadly force. Subjects often refer to SCP-174 as their baby or use similarly strong terms of endearment when referring to it. This effect persists for several hours after SCP-174 and the subject have been separated, and in at least one case the effect had not dissipated two weeks after final interaction. Whether the effect would ever have lessened is unknown, as the subject in question was terminated, owing to lack of compelling reason for further study. Subjects who are completely isolated from SCP-174 will become paranoid as to the figure's safety and often undergo a mental collapse, similar to that observed in mothers separated from young children. 
Class B or stronger amnestics have been shown to be effective in curing both the obsessive effect and the majority of any resultant mental trauma. However, almost all who undergo such treatment complain of feelings of loss and can become depressive. Addendum 174-1 Experiment Log Transcription of Video Footage Subject D14285 Female 21 No History of Violent Crime Supervising Researcher Dr. A Location Containment Cell A4 Researcher and Staff Observing from Behind Two-Way Mirror Site 19 D14285 is ordered to place SCP-174 on their hand. Subject does so after initial hesitation. After several seconds, subject begins a mundane conversation with SCP-174. After roughly two minutes, the subject asks SCP-174, What happened to you? At which point, the figure begins to recount a story of how it was left behind and damaged in a house fire and subsequently discarded by its original owner. Note, subject's records indicate that her house was the victim of an arson attack in 19... Subject begins to console the figure and reassure it with standard positive statements. Figure remarks that it is lonely and wants to find friends. Subject begins to punch and pound the door with their free hand. When guards enter the cell, sidearms raised. The subject recoils to the corner of the cell, cradling the figure and whispering to it, exact words not picked up by microphone. Guards succeed in removing SCP-174 from the subject and leave the cell. At this point, the subject screams they have him, my wonderful baby, and begins punching and kicking the door in a futile escape attempt. Note: At this point, Dr. A ordered the experiment concluded. D14285 was terminated after attempts to calm her failed. This experiment was one of the first conducted with SCP-174, before the efficacy of amnestics had become apparent. Addendum 174-2 Incident 174-A On 2000, Dr. A entered Storage Unit 7 to find SCP-174 sitting on the floor next to its containment unit, looking directly at the main entrance door. The door to SCP-174's unit had been sealed shut, with no access having been logged in the previous week. After being replaced in containment, video surveillance was installed within Storage Unit 7 as a precaution against future translocations, and a GPS tracking unit was attached to SCP-174. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.